right now, I'm here to welcome and then hand the mic back to Bill McKibben for his closing keynote. keynote. Bill, thanks so much for chairing the awards this year and hosting the event today, among so many other things. I don't know how you do it. Your leadership is expiring to all of us. I've come to the conclusion that there are actually three Bill McKibbins. One of them is the author and correspondent, Bill McKibben, who cranks out significant work, nothing repetitive, always insightful perspectives, it seems like every day. If you're not subscribed to his current newsletter, The Crucial Years, somebody please post a link in the chat. You should subscribe now. Uh, his piece on Mansion, especially the third paragraph today, will give you pause. And there's a second Bill McKibben. He's the activist who rallies us to climate action scales in so many ways. Right now, through his latest initiative, Third Act. It's a growing organization network for people over 60 who are focused on climate, voting rights, and racial justice. For those of you who are watching and in this age group, or even if you just know somebody in this age group, please check it out and spread the word. And then, of course, there has to be a third bill. A bill who actually must live a life, eat and sleep and be with his family and ride his bike and actually reflect on all this and sort it out for us. Bill, I don't know how you do it all, but thanks so much. I can't wait to hear your thoughts today. Back over to you. Well, Bob, thank you very much. Look, this has been a really inspiring hour, and um, I, I do not want to bring us down in any way. So I'm going to just begin briefly by telling us, reminding us where we are right now. And I will be brief, and then we'll get on to what we're going to do about it. But to put today's awards in perspective, let's remember what everybody is trying to deal with right now. In the last week, we've seen temperatures in the Antarctic 70 degrees Fahrenheit above normal, the largest temperature deviation ever registered on our planet. And at the same time, the temperature in the North Pole was degrees Fahrenheit above normal. Um, that's not a good sign. It's a sign of just how far down this path of climate destruction we've already come. Simultaneously, of course, we're also watching with horror what's happening in Ukraine, watching an army fight the kind of land war in Europe that many of us thought we would never see again. These things are united, of course. They're united by the fact that both of them are fueled by fossil fuel, by oil and gas and coal. That's what raises the temperature. That's what funds Vladimir Putin's war machine. 60% of his export earnings are from oil and gas. Without them, he would be um, just some, well, without them, he would not have the army that he does. And his biggest weapon for years has been his threat to cut off oil and gas to Western Europe, leaving Germany and France cowering. Um, this is depressing to see that so many of the crises that we face find their roots in the same place. But it's also hopeful in the sense that if we could address those roots, then we would be making enormous strides for peace on this planet, for environmental sanity on this planet, maybe even for some justice on this planet. So let's talk about the possibilities, because I think that they're better sometimes than we understand. I wrote a very large piece in The New Yorker last week. Uh, in certain ways, a kind of update on the end of nature, the first book about climate change for a general audience, a book that I wrote back in 1989, uh, long before most of our award nominees were even born. Um, that piece last week began with those hard truths, but it went on to say that thanks to new developments, we're in a position to do something about them. You know, over the last decade, the scientists and engineers have done their job with remarkable ability. They've dropped the price of renewable energy by 90%. Uh, 
so that now sun and wind and the batteries to store that power when the sun goes down or the wind drops, um, that's the cheapest power available on planet Earth. What that means is that there's no longer a technological or economic obstacle to making fast and important change. Really, we could do something remarkable over the next decade. For 200,000 years, humans have been marked by their control of fire. We're a species that burns things, and it's defined who we are almost from the beginning. Darwin said that along with language, it was the most important component of being human. And of course, in the modern era, fossil fuel, burning coal and oil and gas, is what has transformed our society and produce the modernity that we all see around us. It's those billions of fires in the uh, tiny fires in the uh, uh, cylinders of, of automobiles that move us around. It's the fires in our kitchens that cook our food. It's the fires in our basements that heat our homes. It's the fires in our power plants that provide juice. We could we could douse all those fires, and we could do it very, very quickly. Having spent 200,000 years learning to control fire, now we could spend a decade learning to put it out because we have learned now to take advantage of the fact that the good Lord put a large ball of burning gas 93 million miles away in the sky, and we have the wit to make full use of it. We can catch its rays as they hit our photovoltaic panels, and we can catch the breezes caused by the differential heating of the earth in our turbines as they spin. And if we do these things, well, among other things, as a remarkable study from Oxford University, the world's most prestigious university, pointed out last year, we would save twenty-six trillion dollars over the next few decades. Why? Well, I mean, it'll cost some money to put up all those solar panels and wind turbines, but in return, we no longer have to pay month after month after month after month for a new shipment of coal or gas or oil. Once you've got that solar panel up, the sun delivers the energy for free every morning. <sighs> yeah, we'd have to figure out how to mine lithium and cobalt and things more humanely and with more environmental safeguards than we're doing at present. But in return, we get a world that probably mines about 80% less because once you've mined that lithium once and put it in a battery or a solar panel, well, it's there for a quarter century. It's not like coal where we burn it every day and have to go dig some more. And if we did these things, not only would we have some hope of meeting those climate targets we set in Paris just six years ago now, we'd also have some hope of reigning in the despots like Putin that, that dominate too much of our political life. The thing about fossil fuel is it's concentrated in a few places. So the people who sit on top of those places acquire inordinate power. Vladimir Putin is one example. The king of Saudi Arabia is another. Uh, the Koch brothers, our biggest oil and gas barons in this country, are a third. They've used their winnings to buy themselves a political party and deform our political system. And, and the third thing we would do, and it's the one we forget about sometimes, but is just as important. The third thing we would do if we get off fossil fuel is make life easier for billions of people. Right now, we think that the latest studies, big study last year, that 9 million people a year die from breathing the combustion byproducts of fossil fuel. 9 million is a lot. That's more than COVID, HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, war, and terrorism combined. And all of it's unnecessary because now we have electric bikes and buses and cars. Now we have induction cooktops. Now we have air source heat pumps. Now we have all the ways that we need to make our lives work without degrading lives, especially degrading lives 
for the poorest and most vulnerable people on this planet, because it's not rich people who live next to the highway and breathe the exhaust. We all know who gets to do that. It's the same people who are hit first and hardest by the upsurge in hurricanes, by the spreading droughts, by the worst of the fires. <sighs> Fossil fuel was a force for development, and now it's a force for degradation. And since we can bring it to an end, we should. You would think that given the scale of the problem and given the possibility of the solution, we'd be working all out to make this happen. And some of us are. We've been watching the people who are today and so many thanks to them. But of course, they work against great odds because vested interest, in this case, the fossil fuel industry, does everything it can to keep us from making that change. And we can see it even now, seizing on the war in Ukraine as an excuse to increase drilling and infrastructure for things like liquefied natural gas, instead of seizing this as a moment to, as we did at the beginning of the Second World War, turn our industrial capacity to building things that could make the difference. In this case, less tanks and planes than air source heat pumps or insulation. In order, in order to make this change actually happen, we have to be able to not only work at the grassroots and local level as people are doing so admirably, but also work at the top in order to break the political power of the fossil fuel industry so we can get movement fast and wide. Um, some of that work is in Washington and in our state capitals on things political. And we know what trouble we're in. I mean, there was a remarkable story in the New York Times yesterday detailing how one senator, Joe Manchin, who has held up uh, truly important climate legislation for a year uh, has done so in large part because he spent his whole life uh, trying to safeguard the profits from his coal operation in West Virginia. It was a disgusting story to read, but a reminder of just how this works and how serious we have to be. Washington is not the only place we need to work. We also need to work on Wall Street. Money is the other lever besides politics big enough to pull that it might make a difference. Uh, that's why many of us, young and old, are engaging in work like standing up to the banks who are funding the fossil fuel industry and trying to get them to, well, trying to get them to take a view of the future to build a planet that'll work. You'd think it would be easy to convince them that there's no business to be had on a dying planet, but at the moment they can't think ahead more than one or two quarters, and so we end up in the place where we are. The only way to stand up to all that organized money is with organized people, as my old friend and colleague and judge this year, Reverend Lennox Yearwood, often says. Organized people can do it, but they have to come together, and we're seeing that happen. We've watched this movement begin to expand, and it's expanded most beautifully, and this is exemplified by our winner today among young people. who are really, really punching above their weight, doing extraordinary work. Everybody knows Greta Thunberg, and they should. She's remarkable, one of my favorite people to work with, but she would be the first to say that the best news is there are 10,000 Greta Thunbergs, and they have 10 million followers. But it is not okay, not okay to take the most difficult problems in the world and assign them to 17-year-olds, to tell them to solve our planet in between trigonometry homework and field hockey practice. That's not moral and it's not practical. They need the backup of the rest of us, maybe particularly of those of us like me who've reached a certain age. Um, that's why we're organizing Third Act with people over the age of 60, there's 70 million of us, a population bigger than France in this country. We vote like crazy, so if you want to pressure Washington, there's no way uh, to do it without older people. And fairly or not, we ended up with most of the money, about 70% of the nation's financial assets compared with 5% for millennials. So if you want to push banks and stockbrokers, well, it's going to be some old people there too that are helping out. The most beautiful 
work is when we're able to do this hand in hand. Uh, in the fall, Katie Eater of the Futures Coalition, another one of our judges, uh, told us that young people were organizing against banks and wanted older people to join in. In late October, we had demonstrations around the country. I was in Boston where there was a bunch of us uh, uh, old timers uh, following the lead of the young people. The banner we were marching under at the end of the parade said fossils against fossil fuels. Um, that's the kind of spirit we're going to need if we're going to do what we need to do in the time that we have. I cannot guarantee you that we're going to win this fight because we're far behind and because it's daunting. But we can win it, and I can guarantee you that not just the 10 organizations we've seen today, but all over the world, because I've been all over the world organizing, there are people just like that hard at work all you wonderful representatives of those groups know that you have brothers and sisters in every corner of the world who are working just as hard to get done what needs doing. Sometimes it feels like a burden, I think, for people to be alive at this moment and having to deal with this crisis, and we tend towards anxiety and despair. But looked at another way, it is a great honor and a privilege, too, to get to carry on this most important of fights. Nobody's carrying it on with more panache, more smarts, or more valor than the groups, the 10 groups that we've honored here today, and the many like them around the country and around the world. To them, I can just say, thank you so much. What an honor it is to be shoulder to shoulder with you. We will see you down the road. Thank you.